morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so this, this paper emerges at the productive but also troublesome convergence of my work in transgender history, um, a personal desire and need to move towards stranger and less heavy archives after having spent the past five years in medical archives, and an intensely political need to probe the value of illogic and unreason in a moment of political attack. Only a week ago, a leaked memo from the US Department of Health and Human Services revealed plans to move ahead with a cruel and aggressive anti-trans policy of defining gender exclusively by sex assignment at birth, an attempt to completely disqualify trans people from access to much of the federal government's institutions and services. I've been thinking a lot, among other thoughts, in the wake of this memo and how within the extremely narrow terms of recent trans inclusion, which have largely revolved around the smallest possible expansion of bureaucratic categories and total dependence upon the medical model, that we have very little evidence that reason will be useful in fighting this latest assault. <laughs> I don't really have to convince you of that, but uh, <laughs> I'll still say this though. It would be really easy to, de to debunk and deconstruct this memo's illogic to point out how perilously weak the presumption is that gender can be defined by sex assigned at birth among other things, I consider that kind of debunking part of my job. <laughs> it would be relatively easy uh, to show how, as the memo proposes, um, genital inspection or genetic testing of the population does not provide any reliable or workable policy outcomes. But to do so, to demonstrate the illogic of the memo's attempted retrenchment of the binary, I think would do largely nothing to interrupt the administrative power of the state to make such changes. So long as the state is empowered to govern the population through sex and gender, that administrative power and the distinct vulnerability that it creates for particularly trans, non-binary, intersex people is always protected. In the face of such a kind of realization, I've been hung up on an older feeling uh, that there's also something frankly magical to transness, that it can unlock forms of knowledge and experience that otherwise remain deeply buried uh, in this time and place in which we find ourselves. That's right. <laughs> so whether that magic can intervene against the administrative power of the state is an open question, but it's one that I'm interested in asking and exploring. And so in this paper, I want to offer a really, really initial schema for a set of DIY or do-it-yourself trans practices that can serve as a kind of counter history to the politically depressed emergency of the present. And a bit of a historical testimony, perhaps, to the magic that I've intuited and also needed this week more, more than previous ones. And this sketch also serves within a larger book project I'm provisionally calling Gender Underground as a kind of counter-narrative to a form of occulting that the medical model has imposed since the mid-20th century, the singularization of trans narratives. In The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto, which is often read as a foundational text in trans studies, Sandy Stone suggests that, quote, Transsexuals for whom gender identity is something different from and perhaps irrelevant to physical genitalia are occulted by those uh, for whom the power of the medical slash psychological establishments is the final authority for what counts as a culturally intelligible body. We have so little in the way of trans historiography to begin with that it's perhaps not surprised that the medical model's signature effect overall, which is to reduce the richness of trans life and experience and self-knowledge into a singular narrative, has effects on history too. But I do want to take Stone's choice of the word occulted quite seriously because I think she always chooses words carefully. Uh, and I think it also offers a unique opportunity to think about counter-narratives that would affirm what once occulted, nonetheless, for the same reason, has laid, has laid in plain sight in the past, untapped but, but available in a certain way. So not nearly so vague as trans equals magic, I hope. I, I want to offer three archival vignettes that move in increasingly speculative modes, at least in my initial thinking about them. A hex painted on a house, uh, a trans woman's blistering critique of the medical model at, in the 1950s, mailed to students in a correspondence course, and then very quickly at the end, uh, American artist Greer Langton's invocation of the occult and the sanctified 
the same time in her installation, it's all about me, not you. So a couple of uh, caveats, um, this is like a really fast tour of some deep archives, some that I've been literally in this week in Bloomington, which is to say that I'm only glossing the surface of what I want to do with them, also what I could say about them. Um, second, this is totally new writing and thinking, so I'm really eager for feedback. And third, I really don't know very much about the history of the occult magic and spiritualism in the time period I'm looking at, which is to say the second half of the 20th century, and I'm, I'm not sure it actually really lines up in a direct way. So I'm, I'm eager for direction, correction, and since I felt like rhyming, I don't think I'm anywhere near perfection uh, with this yet. Okay. So I want to start... Um, with this image, which is taken from the San Francisco Chronicle in 1954. In a section that cataloged lighthearted happenings about town, the Chronicle printed this photograph of Louise Lawrence, one of the most famous trans women in the United States in this era, and certainly, probably, in fact, the most well-connected. Lawrence maintained a huge network of correspondence with other trans people around the country and in, around the world, as well as a vital social network in the San Francisco Bay Area and elsewhere in California. Lawrence was personally responsible for connecting sexologists like Bloomington's own Alfred Kinsey or the psychiatrist Carl Bowman or Dr. Harry Benjamin with their first trans acquaintances that established their research on the subject. And so by the mid-1950s, when this comes out, she already had over a decade of expertise uh, organizing and knowledge under her belt. But, of course, if the Chronicle had any awareness of this, they didn't let on. Lawrence is identified by name, and the photo is clear enough to recognize her face, but there isn't any mention of who she is, let alone that she's trans. Rather, the caption directs us to the matter at hand, which I put up there. It's just too interesting not, not to read. There is no sound reason why art and superstition cannot be mixed, and uh, even on the broad side of a red house. Louise Lawrence proved it yesterday at 11 Buena Vista Terrace. She swung herself up on a bosun's chair and painted herself some real, genuine, authentic Amish sect signs. <laughs> they are guaranteed to ward off evil spirits, if any should chance by. Miss Lawrence knows because she has studied the sect and interior decoration. <laughs> they may not be guaranteed against spirits, though they just said it they were, uh, but she believes they add a little pleasant decor to her home. <laughs> yeah. So from, from a letter written to a friend in 1954, I know Lawrence's hex was above all decorative, um, rather than eminently spiritual. Uh, indeed, in painting the outside of her house, she was participating in a much broader trend in American home decor. And the Pennsylvania Dutch, for their part, um, have a long tradition of painting such symbols, usually on the outside of barns, for actual spiritual purposes. Louise was being more cheeky. Uh, I know she didn't consider the hex in any particularly Pennsylvania Dutch sense, let alone in any occult sense. Nonetheless, I want to just sort of sit with this hex as a kind of a historiographical framing device, as an invocation uh, and starting point for the gender underground that I'm calling into being for this project. And, and not only then as a temporal formation, but I'm actually thinking more in light of, of Jana Brown's keynote yesterday as some of the spatial formations for doing this work. So underground as an attention to what is laid in plain sight next to or underneath scenes that otherwise appear to be the height of post-war American conformity. In this case, white middle-class feminine feminine dom domesticity, right? What if it were really trans all along and we just didn't know? It was just submerged and the hex is really our clue. Louise, I don't think really had those radical intentions, but the next person on our tour of the archive really did. So one of Louise's contemporaries was a trans woman named Edith Ferguson who lived in Long Beach in, in Southern California, uh, in LA. That's uh, Edith on your left. Um, the Edith and Louise knew each other, actually. This is Louise often made trips down to LA, and they met at the, in the Long Beach home of a, a mutual friend, Joanne Thornton. And so the other picture is, uh, you, don't see, you don't see Louise there, but a group of them meeting at Joanne's. This Long Beach group, as they were often referred to by inquiring researchers like Kinsey, put together a newsletter in 1952, edited by Joanne, that bore the name Transvestia. 
lasting only two issues, it served as a platform for depathologizing what they um, named under the term transvestism at the turn of the 50s. They also levied incisive critiques of the new medical model of transsexuality like in real time as it was coming into existence. Uh, Edith Ferguson reached a level of erudition and produced a corpus of critical work that really far outpaces the very first transgender studies that were still, you know, over 40 years out. And, but Ferguson did so not in this newsletter they put together, but in her very own correspondence course. Starting in 1951, she began to advertise in magazines and other print forums for a course in female impersonation. So here's an example of an ad, you can barely see it, but um, from Billboard magazine in, in 51. Legitimate female impersonation yeah. developed through personalized lectures mailed to qualified students only. Um, you know, female impersonation, of course, was really more parlance for drag in the 50s, but lest we assume this was a course in how to perform on stage, in reality, Ferguson developed a fully fledged do it yourself program in what she called transmutation, an alternative to transition uh, that the new medical model was bringing into existence in this very moment. So the total cost of the course was a hefty $375, and interested students were to send her a photo and a written close personal description of their appearance, voice, mannerisms, personality, and other physical attributes, as well as a bit about their work and family life. If selected by Ferguson as a worthy student, they would be mailed one to three lectures per week to read and digest, paying the course fee by installment as they went along. With practice and by corresponding with Ferguson for personalized guidance, over 18 months, usually, students would complete the full transmutation course, quote, approximating attendance at standard girls' finishing schools. Oh my. <laughs> um, it's hard to tell how many lectures she really created, and she seemed to more or less stop providing the service in 1955 out of dissatisfaction for her students not being good enough, but it seems she wrote probably around, <laughs> around 200. So as you can gather, there's a lot I could say about the lectures, because I've read probably 60 or 70 of them, but I, I want to get to the heart of the actual DIY process through which transmutation was accomplished, because it gets weird. Mm -hmm. uh, the program included like many, many, many lectures where you had to learn painstaking biology, sexology, and embryology in order to refute the false idea that human beings are sexually binary. But when you got past that and came to transmutation itself, Ferguson composed a set of practices that combine theories of acting that go as far back as vaudeville, but really seem to be hanging out in the early 20th century stage, um, combining that with a theory of energetic thoughts, effects on biology, a discourse on aura and color, and all of this combining into a process that ends in a kind of divine phase of being, that's her phrase, in which the body and mind transmute from masculine to feminine. So I'm actually just going to let her speak um, because she's really long-winded and incredibly idiosyncratic in her writing, and I don't really want to speak over that. So I'm going to give you two snippets, uh, and I kind of want to let her voice speak to us as if we were her students. So I'm not actually going to offer any analysis. It's really baked into the text. So here's, a, here's an excerpt. These are long, so I'm going to put them up to, to follow along. Here's an excerpt from Lecture 10b. Giving vent, then, to this desire of the transvestic individual for self-expression, constant practice, and intelligent cultivation of feminine attributes through artificial means and coordinated study, training, practice, and rehearsal is simply bound to have a dual effect upon the personality, i.e., one, upon the mental attitude, which can evidence itself in a thinking like a woman, and two, upon the feminizing of the physical contour by natural or artificial means within the circumspective areas for development. It may even result in some sort of biological alteration. It certainly can operate mechanically, and thence correspondingly, as an induction for pseudo-acceleration of femininity in some degree of functioning. She goes on. <laughs> Simply put, it is action and reaction, a phase of self-hypnosis stimulating the areas of physical activity and the mental concepts in a certain direction, along a certain pathway, repetition making paths worn smooth, thus impressing the functional state upon the conscious, later the subconscious phases of mind, so that the entire adaptation of a transverse personality becomes automatic and can eventually reach quite beyond this stage, 
or quite beyond this, to the stage where aesthetic transmutation in toto becomes realized, so that the subject lives thereafter in the life, if not merely the fantasy of the adoptive characterization. Numbers of individuals have done this. Many are doing so. Yet little is known of the truth because A, the whole point of inquiry is hush-hush through the condemnatory attitude of society and the paucity of juridical wisdom. B, the individuals are themselves averse to revelation, except before a group of others similarly inclined. And C, the matter of a truly authentic changeover is never discovered except by accident presumably until you read this lecture, okay. <laughs> Follow this with part from lecture 76. It is my fond theory and belief that the only way in which a genetic masculine entity may attain this stage is to completely absorb the identity of the feminine ego. In other words, you will think like a woman when you feel that you are the woman that you are characterizing, provided that you have properly trained yourself to respond in the matter indicated in these lectures. But just feeling alone isn't quite sufficient either. You must proceed to actually motivate your thought processes and mentally seek, grope for, and collect inspiration in the idea of an aura, a mental atmosphere of femininity, and you must definitely abandon the cruder logical processes of masculinity. Again, you must consciously create this aura, create it by inducing a feeling of completed femininity. Cross-dressing will certainly help with a certain amount of auto-hypnosis, for what you do is actually think it into existence. What is this aura? Scientific investigators have discovered the fact that a mental aura is a sort of colored atmosphere. It is colored by various hues perceived under the electrospectroscope. And briefly, these colors or hues depend for their existence upon the thoughts and feelings of the individual. They are a radiation of such thoughts into projected outline, resulting in feelings. And these feelings, in turn, radiate out from the individuals, a distance of approximately three feet, and consciously or unconsciously sway the motives of other persons who are physically close enough and mentally receptive enough to become affected thereby. So Ferguson elsewhere spends long pages critiquing transsexuality as a normalizing device that will pathologize and entrap her fellow trans women. And I think her program in transmutation is, is, is uh, you know, not, not really um, a totally um, spiritual or, or unreasonable alternative. It's, it's really actually based in a lot of her own scientific expertise as a layperson, as well as what you can detect a lot of acting in other stage methods. But her sense of the force of thought and feminine aura to be projected outwards and reabsorbed to the point of actually causing biological, morphological, and personality changes that affect the assumption of life as a woman um, are too esoteric and expansive for me not to name as at least an exercise in speculation, if not something actually more than that. So finally, and very, very quickly, um, I want to turn to a different kind of archive in a little bit later and end this tour in a living room, uh, since the domestic with its possibility as a non-public counterintuitive space for transness is part of what this broader project is interested in. Um, also because this was what was in my abstract when I submitted to this conference, and I don't want to totally disregard that. So I don't have any evidentiary suggestion that this artist was pulling on Louise Lawrence, Edith Ferguson, or the Long Beach group in her turn towards the occult or the sanctified, um, and I actually doubt that she was. But I do feel called to put them alongside one another. So visual scul artist, sculptor, and trans woman Greer Langton, who's most active in the 1970s to 90s, left her entire life's work and just an outrageously gigantic personal archive um, to the Mattress Factory Museum in Pittsburgh. And it serves, this serves as a sort of final case study in a differently powerful um, first occulted artistic work because she was just never very popular um, despite her efforts and she died very young. But that also iconizes transness in the domestic sphere as if that were always where it belonged and perhaps some of these predecessors give us reason to believe so. Um, in this installation, It's All About Me, Not You, produced for the Mattress Factory shortly before her death, Langton painstakingly recreated her Chicago apartment's living room inch for inch, like exactly 100% the way it really appeared. Um, featuring a series of shrines, dolls made in her image, and a deluge of pill bottles cataloging her hormone therapy, but also battles with addiction and anorexia. 
Um, so this is all really what was in her living room. I, I, I don't have much to say about the installation um, alongside the overwhelming volume of her papers, which provide a, literally a day-by-day -day account of the last decade of her life, just an incredible journal that's like this, this, this thick. Um, other than it's sort of a third invitation to undo the occulting that Sandy Stone described through a sort of sacrilegiously spiritual, super anti-cathartic, at times demonic, but ultimately domestic-based aesthetic that radically, I think, houses transness in a living room. Um, so I think, you know, to sort of wrap up, these three trans women, Louise, Edith, and Greer, were to different, differing degrees occulted by trans history with a capital H, obscured to the degree that their relations to transness didn't correspond to the singular mode of the medical model. But they also offer their own not quite occult counter projects, but certainly projects that um, in this moment, you know, are helpful in the way they un embrace unreason and illogic and I think help us to start to think about the undergrounds of gender in the post-war era as an immense source of knowledge, uh, and importantly from the vantage point of 2018, coordinates for a past that hardly had any inevitable endpoint in our current emergencies and inertias. Thanks.